and I am a member of the Greeters Ministry and I would like to take this opportunity to welcome our guests. Please stand when your name is called and remain standing until all guests have been acknowledged. Robert Henderson, good morning. And if there are any other guests who are with us this morning, would you please stand? Well, thank you so much for taking a moment this morning to join us. We are blessed by your presence, and we can only hope that you will be blessed either from the sincere word, the prayers, the music, or just simply the warm fellowship that you will come back and visit with us again. Thank you so much. You may be seated. Well, today is the men's communion service, so I thought I'd just leave a really short thought about our men, something simple. But before I do that, if you haven't done it already, you do know what you're supposed to do on Tuesday, right? Okay. Make, make it sure that everybody knows that if you haven't done it already, be sure to do that. Now let's talk about our men. The real man smiles in trouble, gathers strength from distress, and grows brave by reflection. Men, have a blessed communion Sunday.
morning or I'm bringing you money. This is how I think I'm bringing you money.
And as we gather, prepare for our tithes, I just want to announce, if it's not clear, there's a men's communion breakfast that's going on uh, after service this morning, after our 8 o'clock service this morning, uh, downstairs in the lower hall. Amen. Let us pray together. Lord, thank you for this offering. Thank you for blessing us the way you have blessed us. Thank you for filling our lives with wonder and goodness. And so we return a portion of that that you have blessed us with. And Lord, even for those who are going through hard times, we can look back and realize, Lord, that you've lifted us through it before and you're going to do it again. And so, Lord, in all that hopefulness and trust in you, we give so that the work of the church may go forth so that somebody might be blessed, somebody might hear a liberating word. And all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Amen. Part of our scripture lesson this morning is coming from two scriptures. You have one of them listed, which is the sixth chapter of the book of Deuteronomy. Sixth chapter, verses four to nine. And then the other one is going to be from Mark chapter 12, verse 28b to 31. And so I lift up Deuteronomy, first of all, to us. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be upon your heart, And you shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. And you shall bind them as a sign upon your hand, and they shall be as fontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And turning to Mark chapter 12. Page 881. Thank you, Deacon Taylor. Which commandment is the first of all? And Jesus answered, The first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Well, there is no other commandment greater than these. May God add a blessing to the reading of those powerful and righteous words. If you would join me in a moment of prayer, Lord, we come to you, we just give you thanks for this morning and for these words lifted up to us and for us, Lord. We ask that you not only allow us to read it, but to perceive what you're saying to us in these moments in which we stand, these hours in which we live. For one thing is always certain, Lord, and that is that you are the potter and we are the clay. So mold and shape us as you would have us to be until we're perfectly fitted for your kingdom and able to call ourselves disciples of Jesus the Christ. Now as we come to this teaching time, Lord, you hone it, you shape it, you develop it. You send it forth as you see fit. Allow it all to be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, our Lord and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. I want to spend just a little bit of time this morning speaking on the subject, putting words into action. Words into action. Now most of the gospel stands on the foundation of the Old Testament, or what is known as the Hebrew Scriptures. And of course, that is the case because Jesus, Peter, Paul, and all the others were steeped in traditional Jewish beliefs and culture. They knew the Scriptures and they knew the traditions. They understood the renderings of the faith, the stories of the Scriptures, and of course, the poetic and melodious rhythm of the Psalms. There were the words of the prophets, their teachings, and the heroic and sometimes mixed-up histories of the judges. There were the stories of resistance and the love sonnets found in the Song of Songs. They knew these stories, the telling of them, and the liturgical context that they were wedded to. People could and would spend hours talking about the significance of scriptures and the stories and what they taught. And the people could talk and talk and talk and talk. In fact, the Midrash developed as part of these conversations about the meaning of the text. The Midrash are writings dealing with the Hebrew text that is a specific compilation of rabbinic writings composed between 400 and 1200 of the Common Era. And then there's later editions that continue to expand And the word midrash is derived from the root of the verb darash, which means resort to, to seek, to seek out with care, to inquire, and to require. The midrash was initially a philological method 
of interpreting biblical texts. It gradually developed into a sophisticated interpretive system that reconciled apparent biblical contradictions, established the scriptural basis of new laws, and enriched biblical content with new meaning. Let me put it this way. The teachers and the leaders, they looked at the text, and they talked and talked and talked and analyzed and overanalyzed the text. Now we also have that in the Christian tradition. It is generally called the interpreter's Bible and is created from snippets of academic ex- discussion that seeks to look at scriptures interpretively, textually, and historically. The scriptures were written in a context and with a historical backdrop. The interpreter's Bible discusses the scriptures from those varied perspectives. In other words, they talk and they talk, they write, and they write, and they talk, and they talk, and they talk a bit more. So we had the Midrash and the Interpreter's Bible and other references for teachers and preachers that discuss and examine Scripture, and they talk and talk, and they write and write, and they talk, and Jerry Seinfeld would refer to it as yada, yada, yada. These texts that are before us, if you look at them closely, however, they are similar in construction and instruction. They each contain the Shema, which is the central prayer of Judaism. You know, Shema Yisrael, Adonai, Eloheinu, Adonai, Echad. They both speak to the centrality of God in the world, God in our lives, and God in our hearts. God means our very existence and therefore is our very essence. This is why both scriptures urge the loving of God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. But if you will notice, there is a slight difference in the rendering of Deuteronomy in Mark. In the urging to love God, Jesus adds the term mine, mine, as in loving God with not only our whole heart and not only with the entirety of our soul, but also with the fullness of our mind and certainly with all our strength. Jesus adds mine to our sense of the centrality and relationship that we're to have with God. Let me look at it this way. When, When something is good, don't you think about it a little while? When you have had a good experience, you, 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 you think about it in, in moments of, of quietness. When, when someone does something good for you and to you, you think about it for a while. When the flames of a new romance kindles ambers in your heart, you think about that for a while. Well, well, God has been good to you, and, 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 and therefore the urging here is to bring your mind to the worship of God. Think about God a while. Meditate upon your experiences with God for a while. And, and then the text goes on in Deuteronomy, and it says, don't forget to also talk about God. Don't forget to tell people about the centrality of God, the power of God, the blessings of God, the deeds you've experienced with God, and the presence of God. Don't forget to talk about the Lord, the text says. Talk about God all the time. The writer of Deuteronomy suggests, recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away and when you lie down and when you rise up. Bind them as a sign on your hand and fix them as an emblem on your forehead and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. But see, see, one of the things here, if you look at the text, you know, it's sort of loving God and, and, and with all our heart, with all of our strength, with our might, right? But, but in, in, when you look at Deuteronomy, there's a kind of abstraction that takes place. God is a little bit removed from people. We even hear people today talking about God and personifying God in this way as a, 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 a man with a white beard sitting on a cloud. It ain't me, y'all. 
I've even heard people refer to God as the man upstairs. You see, what I'm getting at is those expressions, God is removed from us. God is not a part of our daily experience. Not, God is not intimately engaged in our lives, but God becomes a kind of philosophical abstraction out there. When I, when I think about that, you know, it's, it's, it's like in royal courts, people are not the same. The king always sits higher than anyone else. Ranks within the court are always signified by how high up one sits. In royal courts like in ancient Thailand, when, when the king gives a speech, he, he did so from a throne that is elevated to a point that his feet are higher than everyone else's head. And the guests of the, the, the Thai royal palace in ancient days were traditionally required to approach the king and queen crawling on their hands and knees. In ancient times, it was a criminal act to even look at the king. The king was an abstraction, was removed, was never really not mortal, was not among the people. They governed the people, but they were not among the people. The royal courts all over the world got this sense of hierarchy and superiority from their understanding of God or gods or goddesses and their relationship to mortals and human beings and men and women. Kings and queens were untouchable like was our concept of God. But Jesus, when he teaches here in Mark, is stating that God is not far off like a king or queen. God is not aloof and above you. Jesus poses an intellectually yet practical equation. He focuses upon the scriptures in a wise and analytical way. He declares that the distance of God is shrunk by the actions of the people of God. Jesus believes that God has a heart and a soul and a mind and power, and God is present in the movements of the people of God. Jesus knows that people may talk about the right things, but that doesn't mean that anyone who reads the scripture will do the right thing. Jesus, therefore, is challenging this gap between the love of God, the centrality of God, the seriousness of God, versus the actions that the lovers and followers of God does or does not do. And so, therefore, Jesus adds that other thing as your evidence of your relationship with God. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If you claim to have all of this love and reverence for God, let me see it concretized in the world. Let me see it in terms of your relationship to one another. Let me see it in terms of your relationship to your neighbor. You see, you see that's, that's how I know right now the leadership of this country is as wrong as two left feet. Because their idea of concretizing the scriptures and they always want to wrap themselves in the gospel of Jesus Christ and pretend that they got a prayer life and a worship life. But then they begin to negate the very core values that have been taught to us by Jesus. Jesus says, okay, you got the abstract reality down that you love God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And Jesus says, let me take that now and put it to the test. Do you love your neighbor as yourself? That is the test of your relationship with God. As it says in, in the scriptures, you know, how can you claim to love God who you have not seen, the fire of God, and hate your brother and sister that you have seen? Right? It, it, it points up the clear contradiction. Jesus is attempting to take our abstract understanding of God and render a concrete action on behalf of our relationship with God. Jesus sees an abstraction when people talk about God, when they do the rituals of holiness, and when they engage in all of the traditions that they have been doing since time memoriam, but do not do justice or mercy or walk humbly with God, as Micah says. It seems that Jesus felt that the love of God... And the fear of God 
was a far-off reality that begged to be defined and concretized through actions. In other words, the reverence of God was meaningless without actions that blustered and affirmed one's acclamation of God. You see, in this atmosphere today, where disrespect and hatred passes for politics, and people who think of themselves as religious and revering of God, but see nothing wrong with the use of painful and hate-filled words, we begin to see that Jesus has a point here. Jesus understood that we compartmentalize our lives. We have holy things that are contained on one day, maybe two days, but only in one or two hours so that it doesn't make a great inconvenience. And then there are secular things that take place all the rest of the time. We can think of ourselves as good people because we went and we spent 45 minutes in a mass or an hour in church service and then spent all the rest of our time raising hell in the world. Or we write a big check to the church and therefore we think that we absolve ourselves from our conduct. But the reality is here. You cannot negate the core values of what Jesus is trying to teach to those who are listening. If you love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength, then you had better show it by loving your neighbor. So he puts it to the test. He says, this is the test of your heart. This is the test of your claimed relationship with me. Jesus is suggesting that all times are holy and sacred times and calls for us to act in holy and sacred ways with each other. The ways we act towards one another is actually a reflection of whether we truly revere God. Jesus, can you hear folk talking? We, Jesus hears us going yada, yada, yada. Jesus can hear us talking and talking and talking and talking. People have been talking about the politics of this country. People have been talking about the hatred in this country. People have been talking about the divisions in this country. People have been complaining about the xenophobia expressed in this country. So now it's time that we stop talking and do something. It's time to stop talking and put our words into action. Elections are Tuesday. Stop talking and start doing. Why, what are you going to do with your frustration? And, and, and what are you going to do with your hurt? And what are you going to do with your anger? What are you doing, going to do about the mass shootings or the racial killings or the hate crimes that are reported and unreported all over this country? What are you going to do about the rich just enriching themselves and impoverishing all kinds of other people? You know, folks say, well, look at the numbers. The economy is good. Look at the jobs that's been produced. Those jobs are not even jobs in which you can keep a roof over your head. Let's be honest about what's going on in this country right now, today. What are you going to do about it? It's time to stop talking. But I got news for you. It doesn't end on election day. It doesn't end then. Because it's time that we take our talk and we put our talk into action. It doesn't solve anything. Even if we take the Congress and even if we take the Senate, we still better be active because sisters and brothers, if you don't realize what has happened and how fragile democracy is, then you have been... 